Welcome to the Unsecurity Podcast. Each week, Evan and Brad give an inside look at current information security news, breaches, best practices, and other things you should know to improve your information security. Here are your hosts, FR Secure's Evan Francine and Brad Nye. Hi, right, welcome listeners. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Unsecurity Podcast. This is episode 128, and the date is April 20th. To- 2021. Uh, joining me is my good friend, great guy, awesome, you know, everything, I guess, pretty much, Brad and I. But also, we have a special treat. Joining us today is uh, my good friend, Roger Grimes. Welcome, Roger. Hello. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's cool, man. So, I was before we started the show, it was uh, we were talking about how we got to know each other. And the very first time, you know, there's certain people you meet in your life, and the very first time you meet them, you're like, that's somebody I want to hang with, right? That's somebody that there's a connection. You know, it's, uh, we see security so much the same way. Since then, you know, we've done other things. Uh, you know, saw you at RSA. You've been at RSA, I don't know how many times. For our listeners who don't know Roger, uh, how many books have you written now? Twelve. <laughs> twelve <laughs> books, All right? So Roger's written twelve yeah. books. Uh and are you working? You said you were working on a couple now. Yeah, we're working on three. And I've actually I've written, I, I count them up. I keep a list 1,100 articles. I do about one or two or three a week, you know, literally week after week for 20, 25 years now. So really all that just adds up to I'm pretty old and I've been doing it a long time. That's really all it really means. I don't know, man. You're, you got a hell of a lot of skill and yeah. uh, you're a hell of a good writer. You know, it's cool that when you see somebody kind of fit into their their niche and you know, just kick ass. So you know, I, I got lucky. I, I actually found out what I liked in life and got to do it. And I got to tell you, there's probably, you know, 95% of the world is not blessed that way, but I, I was, and you are, and you, you find your thing and then it's, you know, it's still work, but it's, it's more than work, right? It becomes that mission that you so much talk about. And, you know, that's what the, and that's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping before I leave this world that I have made a significant impact on improving computer security and just just being able to be can you imagine working on the internet and it just being able to send an email and, and work and not have to worry about hackers and fishers and malware that's my dream for us to have that and we will have that one day and i just want to help accelerate it yeah well I mean, a good friend of mine too is chris roberts and chris is i mean it's just so many it's so cool how there's so many different personalities in this industry, right? Because Chris is of the belief that half the population is going to have to die first. You know, like, oh, God, oh, please no. <laughs> you know, let's try to stop that, right? You think we're going to have to go through a whole, I mean, what's what's it going to take? We're going to have to, like, really suffer some pain first? Or do you think we'll figure it out before that happens? Well, you know, th- there's something to be said about that. That there's two schools of thought, really. And I am kind of of that. that the, the, we're, you, you're taught in school and stuff to be proactive and everything, and you know, take care of it. Turns out, you can really get fired by trying to get to be too proactive. And that people that a lot of times last are the people that just do what they're, they're told. But you know, it, it's interesting that most of the time we don't really do big things until there's pain. Like after 9/11, can you imagine if they tried to before 9/11? Say that we had to wait in lines and go through body detectors and throw our water away. You had to, you know, take baby formula and prove that it was baby formula. And we'd have to take our shoes off. There's no way we would have done it. The industry wouldn't have required it. Then 9-11 happens. And now we're all holding our hands up and, you know, letting them look at our new bodies or whatever. Which right. one's got to be the uh, worst job on the planet because most of us don't look like models. <laughs> but, uh you know, it's yeah, interesting. When they, when they do that with me, they're just like, just go, just go, just go, just go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and so I've been saying, yes, that we're going to have, it's going to take like a 9-11 event, a digital 9-11 event. But by that, I mean, the stock market down for a day or something. It's probably going to be, some, if you look at the past really big things like going back to 1988, the Robert Morris worm, and then uh, the SQL Slammer worm, which is the fastest malware program that ever hit the internet in 10 minutes and stuff. Usually they're coding errors. A person was trying to see if they could do it and they didn't put rate uh, rate throttling on it and it just went out of control. That's you look, you know, if you think history is a guide for the future, it could be that. So, but I've been predicting that for 
20 years and people before me predicted that the internet was going to have a meltdown and it really hasn't. So there is another school of thought that it's just going to meander on like it is all these bumps and bruises and warts. I mean, already, I can't believe how bad it is. You think about ransomware, it's taking down entire, you know, entire companies and cities and police departments and hospitals and everything. And like, we literally, it's, 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 it's bad. You can be taken down at will. Any of us, us three here could attack and take down any company it will we don't have to be innately brave we just kind of know how to do it and it's amazing that it's not more secure already like what would it take <laughs> it's you know, pretty bad yeah one, one of the things we see and i've said for forever is there's two people that do uh proactive uh information security people that have suffered through an incident and know what it's like and people who have seen someone who's gone through it but other than that nobody yeah. The majority of our incident cases well, coming in. They... Well, my fear is, you know, the speed of technology, the way how fast we adopt technology is far outpacing our ability to secure it. So the things that we have to do, I mean, people just plug in stuff all over their homes, you know, your cars. Now you got, you know, pacemakers with tele- telemetry and Bluetooth. You know, I mean, it's like, holy crap. Yeah. So we, you, we used to be able to separate information security from safety, right? They weren't integrated, but now they're integrated. So now conceivably, not only can I ransomware you, but I can kill you. Mm-hmm. In some for cases. sure. I'm sure people are being physically killed every now and then. For sure. Yeah. We did that biohacking village at DEF CON last year, and that was terrifying, like eye-opening. You know, you've got pumps, infusion pumps. They are open to FTP that have everything. You can change Right. Dosing and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, back in the 90s, I actually worked at a hospital. I was a hospital IT administrator for a lot of years. And we actually had a lab test that was going back to a, a ICU cardiac unit. And the power went out and it combined two lab tests. So this person was having a heart attack. You, you take these chemicals. And at the time, they were called CPK levels. And the CPK levels came back. No, they're low. So the person didn't have a heart attack. They were just having an angina or something like that. And they didn't treat the person. Well, the person died. And then we went to the lab and the lab had actually results that no, they were significantly elevated. And there should have been this entire another treatment. And um, I, I was like, how did it happen? And this is going to sound like I'm making it up, but it truly did happen. So I'm trying to troubleshoot and troubleshoot what went on. And what I found out, and again, this is, you'll hear an internet rumor, but I, I swear I'm being honest here. And this is what the cause was. It was truly a, a guy cleaning a buffer, cleaning the floor, a guy on an, ele- he, w- he would plug it in between the two elevators and it would cause the dot matrix printers at the time, Oki data, if you remember those things, oh, with line 192s or whatever, it, it caused it to reset. And it had reset in the middle of two labs. And so when it came back up to the where the old one had stopped printing, the new one started printing. And I remember when I came, I was like, I wonder if it was a power outage. I actually pulled the report up. I said, if I'm right, this report will be off. And it was. It was off by one line and one column. That's how close it was. Oh. And, uh, and I was sitting there trying to figure out how it happened while we lost power. And I was doing that. The guy came and plugged in the plugged in his buffer, which he did every day. And it caused it to reset. And one of the nurses was like, oh, yeah, that happens every time that guy plugs that thing in. And so we just put a UPS on it, but it actually, I, I remember that it actually got reviewed by the hospital board. And they went, Oh, we're not going to report this as uh, something because he would have died anyways. It was a catastrophic heart attack. And even if we treated it with the drugs, he would have died. So they're able not to even report it. Uh, but the people that were there with me, they, they would have to go, yes, yes, that really did happen. Uh, but I thought, you know, now you've got the directly internet accessible, you know, in the wild thing, I'm, I'm sorry to talk, but no, I love it. Is that we went from, I've been doing this since like 1988, 87, 88 from, 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 uh, Macs where Apple's really big and then DOS took over and then Windows took over and then the whole email thing. And then, you know, all this stuff all the way up to IOT today. And it seems like every time we get some new type of communication medium that we are learning the exact, all the same lessons. Like now we're in IOT world and there's nobody in our field that doesn't think that we're not going to suffer all the same problems, you know, buffer overflows, malware, you know, hacker passwords, mm-hmm. hard coded and clear text. Yeah. And Bruce Schneier in his book, which was, uh, what was it called? Click and die or something like that. He said, it is going to be cheaper to let a IOT device stay on the ground and step on it than it is to pick it up. 
right? Mm -hmm. That you're just going to have so many IoT devices and sensors and everything's just going to be a chip that they're just going to be everywhere. And of course, insecure. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the sad thing about it is, I mean, one of my biggest frustrations is we haven't made any progress. You know, we're still talking about the same things today that we were talking about 20, 30 years ago. It's just a different technology in a different context, but it's the same basic fundamental stuff. And now yeah, that people yeah, are yeah, plugging yeah, stuff yeah. in at home, you know, now it's it's in your homes. Right? You have no privacy. You know, it's crazy. Yeah, 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 for sure. And it's again every year. So I used to write for InfoWorld and CSO magazine. Every year they'd say, Hey, write this end of the year thing review, how what was hacking like? And what do you think hacking is gonna be like? And I pretty much would say it's gonna be pretty much the same but worse. And then sometimes I would sit there and go, I can't believe it's going to get worse. So let me go with like last year is ransomware. Ransomware has taken over hospitals and cities and police stations, you know, shutting down multiple American cities, Baltimore and, and Atlanta, Georgia for weeks and months and, you know, Texas school systems. And I'm asking myself, could it get worse? And I went, okay, I'm going to write a column that says yes, but I do not know how it's going to get worse because it seems to be as bad as bad as it can be. And then at the end of 2019, this is about when I was writing this, they started exfiltrating data and attacking the employees and the customers of those victims. And it got worse. Like all of a sudden, and now the, the, the ransoms are more expensive that are, you know, they went from, I think it was an average of 16,000 to now like the average is like a hundred thousand. The, the percentages of people paying are going up because of extra trading this data and the backup's not going to save you anymore. And so this year I said, I'm like, well, how could it possibly get worse? And then nation state duo. <laughs> now we have nation states that are just used to be they'd have a zero day, they'd keep it and they wouldn't attack people. Now they're like, eh, we're going to waste four across 200,000 exchange servers. We don't, we obviously don't care if they detect it. Now, what are you right. going to do? Well, and on the ransomware front, too, I mean, I, they even went another step now because now we're starting to see them actually call your customers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're blackmailing. Hey, it. by the way, we just ransomed your vendor. Well, in the it, word, but, yeah. oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say no. That they, they and they even automate it now, right? They'll uh, automate and send the emails, and they've done they've done and they've done just terrible stuff. Like they're like, if you don't pay us, we're going to release the videos, the mental health, the videos you that were recorded of you when you were a teenager having a mental health problem. And they right. not only threaten it, they're doing it. I mean, they just have no more absolutely. Lack of any type of the will attack hospitals, you know, attack COVID vaccine making labs. Mm -hmm. Like, like it, it's sad to me about the human condition that there's this large part of the world that says, "Hey, it's a it's a victimless crime," and then they will do absolutely. And would they kill people to get the money? There's no doubt in my mind that if they had to kill a couple of innocent people to get paid, they'll do it. Yeah. Well, you bring up a good point. What about terrorists? I mean, mm -hmm. let's take the, it's not just you know, criminals for profit that we need to protect against. We've got nation state, like you sort of alluded to. We have also got terror organizations. You know, I was doing some work for um, some really large, you know, ag co-ops in this country. And oh my gosh, if you attack the food supply, oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's it, it, a high schooler. <laughs> they do it. Yeah, they're, they're not great. Yeah, we had one of the IRs was for, uh, a company that had made some portion of COVID tests and they were, it took them about three weeks to get back fully running. And was that the one, was that the one where the cyber insurance companies had to negotiate payment? Or the, the I, can't remember, I can't remember. We had so many. It, it's, it's yeah. five, five, mile, five miles from my house is the water treatment plant that got, where the Old company smart. broke it, yeah, broke in and and then changed the chemical level like a hundred or a thousand times. And two things that struck me that, by the way, I applaud them for revealing the data, the publicly revealing it, because most companies aren't going to do it, and they are either naive enough or, or ethical and good enough that they decide to release the information. But I think all of us looked at it and went, couldn't have been a professional criminal because they wouldn't have been this obvious. They wouldn't have logged in during the day. They would have done this mm -hmm. at night when they wouldn't have been noticed. They probably wouldn't have right. turned on the chemical. Why would I yeah. ever use an interactive, you know, session? Right. <laughs> but you're like, this guy logged in like during the only time when they thought they could possibly be an employee on that system. And then uh, the other part of me was like, they're like, don't worry, we would have caught this, right? Like we would have caught the level going up. I got to tell you, 
and I love them. I don't have a lot of faith, and that's a oh, computer wow. sensor is going to catch the chemical going up a thousand times right away. Well, you know, we, with the, I mean, we all know what level of logging most places have <laughs> non existent. <laughs> When you have 3389 hanging out there with the username and password and, you know, or whatever else you got, oh if, if you don't know that, and you, and you have a that you're actually going to detect them and be able to. And every, let me say, every time you hear from that example or this bank was taken over or this, I literally say that's the only one we know about today. And there's 10,000 others just like it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? well, and, and my first, so it was it two, 1998. Shoot, I don't even remember the year. Obama issued that presidential directive, right? Which I thought was a good thing. It was really about, you know, cybersecurity and critical infrastructure, right? And so that led to NIST creating their, you know, doing their thing, right, with the CSF. And then they it, they made it voluntary, right? So, yeah. Yeah. You know, so the, there was that piece. And then you go, so like, think about it from like, let's say Oldsmar, the, um, the water treatment plant or facility. And you say, hey, we really need to secure things. Even if you made it mandatory, here, here's NIST CSF. Boom. These are water treatment people that they run a water treatment plant. They're not security experts. That is way too much, way too complicated. How about if you just make two things? Find out what you got exposed to the internet and secure it. Or hey, you ready, it ready for this? You ready for my solution? It yeah, has been yeah. for 20 years. This whack-a-mole is just crazy. We need to fix the infrastructure that allows criminals to broadly act in criminal ways. Like right. as long, you know, imagine if we had a banking system where we allowed people routinely to rob things, caught almost no one, let them get decreasing amounts of money, and then we actually didn't fix the infrastructure that allowed them to do it. So in the 1920s, when Bonnie and Clyde and all the people robbing stuff, the cops went, oh, my God. They're just going across city lines and state lines. They're always doing that. And they've got better guns than us. Blah, 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 blah. They got together and they figured it out. This is the things we need to increase. And we've got to have less money in the tiller at the time. We've got to put these things. And we've got to put tellers behind glass. And, and like they fixed the problem. Well, my thing is we need to fix the internet. The substrate is broken. And until we fix the infrastructure, we're not, you cannot fix it with a whack a mole problem uh, issue because we're, you're right. Evan, there, people are not going to be able to do what it takes. It's actually kind of a complex thing to do and build and fix, prepare. And it's, I think, the wrong approach. Hey, on Security Podcast listeners, real quick break. This is Evan. Wanted to let you know that from this point on in the podcast recording, we have some really minor audio issues where every time Brad and I speak, there's an echo. You can still hear what we're saying, but there's that irritating echo. Now, we think the issue might have been something to do with our guest computer system where there was some feedback. The good thing is, is every single thing that Roger had to say came through crystal clear. So you can hear his content, you can hear his stories, you can hear his advice. That's all really great stuff. We decided to go with the recording as is, as opposed to re-record, because the flow was good, the content was good. The only thing we had was this irritating echo. So... Let's get back to it, and hopefully you'll enjoy. So you're, well, let me let me propose something, because here's my solution, and a lot of people, and I suspect, Evan, you might not like my idea, but um, we, we're, we think a lot of ways. We agree on 90% of the stuff, and this may be the 10% where maybe we don't agree. But I think that the internet has to be built so it decreases the chance for pervasive anonymity. That you build two top, two basically channels of the internet. One where it can be like it is today, and if you need to be anonymous and do anonymous things, you can do it. But then, if you want to connect to my banking server, my email server, I'm going to require this higher quality of service that says you are who you say you are. So, for different websites and services, both sides can negotiate the type of assured identity and what has to be in there, so that it really again. I wish I never had to take an email to my email server that a person didn't at least have to claim who they are. If you're anonymous and you care so much, you want to stay anonymous, cool, stay anonymous. Or if you need to go to a cancer therapy or, you know, some type of, uh, you know, sexually transmitted disease thing where you want to be anonymous, you should have the ability to do it and go anonymously. But then a bank should be able to go, you know, we only want to do business with somebody that's going to have their real identity confirmed before they connect to us. And the same thing with an email server. So I see this idea of this multi-tiered, uh, different levels of uh, identity assurance. 
And then both sides agree what's the minimum level we'll accept where the two sides will connect to each other. I think that's a big part of making the internet more secure. Uh, yeah. That's a good idea. I'm, I'm going to just get Evan all riled up. Uh, we should uh, use social security numbers for that. <laughs> Come on. It's Friday afternoon. You can't rile me up now. <laughs> but the, uh, you know, the, one of the things I've learned a lot, I think, with the, the, the world kind of thing going on is the importance of other people's perspectives, right? Uh, you know, giving people the opportunity to voice their, their opinion, their ideas, uh, because there's good stuff in it, right? I mean, it takes all these different perspectives to solve all challenging problems. I agree. Not, you don't want to give anybody all the power to say, this is the way we're going to do it without any other people kind of give their thing and say, I think there's a lot of merit actually to your idea. Yeah. Um, I think it has to be really well thought out and we'd have to make sure that, uh, you know, somebody doesn't abuse it. And people abuse these crap everywhere, you know? Yeah, that, my, mine would be, we could really have two tiers, uh, meaning that we could even keep the internet as it is and you can completely stay on that and you'd have to opt into this more assured model. And again, it could actually be tiered. So you could still, even I, they have multiple identities and anonymous identities and pseudo anonymous identities where some third party knows who I am, but I can still use this alias or whatever. Um, it, but, it, but, you know, at least both sides agree what's allowed because there's a whole lot of services that don't want people claiming to be that they're Bill Gates, you know, or something and, and, and connect. And that's even, you know, now with deep fakes and that sort of stuff, like I, I was think, thinking about deep fakes today, if they get so good that it's going to be hard to tell that it really is somebody. I thought, well, then you have to add the contextual clues like we do with regular authentication. Are they coming from a device they normally come from? Are they coming from a location that they normally come from? And all of that stuff, again, kind of takes some increased authentication and integrity. And, and I throw, uh, as I'm throwing this out, I actually think my idea would fail because a lot of governments would want it. The governments, certainly in China and Asia and India, they literally rebuilt their infrastructures to spy on their citizens. But even in America, where we have really good freedoms, our government wouldn't like it if their ability to hack us easily went away. <laughs> well, I mean, you saw that was it was the FBI dropped uh, two how many exchange servers? They went in and just cleaned up that web shell without killing the company. Or even yeah. you know that like cell phones are so hackable, right? SIM swap attacks and all this stuff. But people always go. Why are they so hackable? Like when they're based upon uh, signaling security seven SS seven. Which we've known for decades is super hackable. So the underlying infrastructure, logical infrastructure, is super hackable. And you're like, but the government has all these stingray devices where they want to get your cell phone to connect to them so they can listen in on your conversations. And like, they don't want you to make Signal Eight, SSL Eight, or whatever it is, SS Eight. So it's you know that, that that's you know, and then you have the whole thing in void. Uh, hey, we, I want to have encryption. Like, I, I'll be honest with you. I don't mind my government trying to spy on me. I swear I'm actually kind of all right with it. I mean, I, I don't want it, but okay, I get it. But when they tell me that they have to allow them, themselves to spy on me, I'm ready to pick up a weapon. Right. I'm like, you're telling me I can't have an encrypted conversation with my wife, that you have the ability anytime you want to to come listen to me? No. Then I'm ready to be like a patriot. <laughs> 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 crazy. Well, I, and I get the same way because I may think I'm not doing anything Wrong, you know, yeah. but, but things are always open to interpretation, taken out of context, and used against people. Yeah, that's my mm -hmm. that's my problem. Is you'll take one word I said or one sentence I said outside of the context of where I said it. You say, "Oh my gosh, this look at this guy. He's a bigot, or he's a you know, he's a terrorist, or he's a whatever." And the next thing I know, I'm in court, and I'm like, "But that was a longer conversation, you know." <laughs> that's the problem yeah. I have. With it. And and I also know from enough attacking myself that one of the things that I, if, if it's important enough, is to build an attack profile. You know, if my target is important enough, I want to gather all the information I can. I want to try to figure out what your behaviors are. I want to try to figure out where you're going to be, where you, you know, what you're going to do when you get there. Um, and the more information I can gather, whether it's social media or if I could eavesdrop, you know, so I, I think there's that piece, maybe. I don't know. I mean, there's a reason whaling is so profitable and, and people are doing it. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is so I, you know so it's interesting so I want to make a more secure internet but you know people say what and I literally I, I, I've thought about it I've written about it. it it literally wouldn't be that hard we can, we actually have all the protocols and everything we need we literally have to get the ICANN or whoever and a bunch of internet people in a room and say okay this is going to be the services these are the tables and this is the way it's going to work but you can literally work it out in a couple of weeks and you don't need super geniuses to do it the part that you that the hardest part is you can't get people around your own dinner table who agree on a topic, much less different individuals around the world. Mm-hmm. And so back to Evan, to your point, what's it going to take to get a more, more secure internet? I, I think it requires pain because it's only in moments of pain that we actually pull together. That is true. Sadly, I mean, it's people, I think, that have been around for a while and have full thought and, can, and some vision can predict what's going to be. Right. I mean, we know uh, kind of what the next few years are going to look like. We knew before ransomware was a thing that ransomware was going to be a thing because you were taking away their return on investment and debit card information. Right. You were making it harder for the attackers to monetize that. The prices were going down. And then, you know, a cheap and pin, that's where they all were then. But now it's like, now it takes more of an investment for me. So my return on that investment. So where do I go next? Well, let's. Well, thanks for answering. So then, what's the next? Actually, that's great. I've never heard of that. That, that, that I mean, it makes perfect sense. Why well, I haven't thought about it that way? Wow. Yeah. Well, it, it, yeah, I don't know, man. You're not supposed to give me compliments. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Yeah, they're just moving to where it's easier to make money, and yeah, I get, you know, they go where the money is. Why did you know, supposedly the theoretical Willie Sutton? Why do Rob Banks is where the money is? And so the same thing with ransomware. You know, is it going to go away? No, they're making a ton of money. And I even, I was reading an uh, interview with apparently one of the top ransomware guys, and he's, and he essentially was saying, we're going to do whatever it takes to make you pay. So he's like, okay, we're going to ask you for the, we're going to encrypt your data. And if that doesn't work, then we're going to tell you we have your data exfiltrated. And if that doesn't work, he then says, we're going to denial of service attack you and take down what other remaining services you might have. Then we're going to attack your employees. Then we're going to attack your customers. And he goes, listen, we just want to get paid. Just pay us, right? I mean, that's that's his mentality. And and now they have affiliates and networks. And it's always so much more, you know, criminal mafia gang like like affiliates, affiliate marketing. And he was talking about he was getting competition from other guys that used to work for him, and now they pulled off and they're making their own, you know, making their own ransomware companies and affiliate marketing programs. He's like, oh, and of course they've got really they've got some great programs on you know, hand it to them. And he, he sounded like almost any CEO of any company ever heard of. They even saw an infrastructure diagram from another one. And the redundancy in the network was easily done by somebody that was super trained and large redundant networks. It wasn't a kid playing around, you know, with data centers and multi-tiered data centers, and redundant this and trunks. And, and you're, you're like, oh, my God, we're going up against these professional criminal organizations, really smart people. And um, well, it's crazy, too, because I remember when the first person that this came out of You'd have to buy it, and then you download it, and you'd have to put all that stuff together. Right. And now it's software as a service. Yeah. And now they've got customer service lines. They've got, you know, so it, it is a legitimate business. Like my software as a service ransom isn't working. You pick up a phone, you call them, they're like, "Oh, we'll try this." It might be a little more effective if you tweak that. It's like, what the hell? Yeah, they have rate, right, and you rate them on Amazon like rating system, right? So, like, oh my god, my. But you are know, people are making less money. If you start to make less money, you get rated worse. So we'll do what it takes to make sure, hey, no, no, you come with me and you'll get more money with me. And I'm going to charge you a cheaper rate on the, on the, uh, the crypto, you know, version, you know, pop out. And they have all these services, these tiered service structures where they're taking a piece of, you know, we got money, trusted money mules and stuff like that. You just, it's, 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 you know, you know, it's funny though, how much this, Gets repeated over and over again because even in the debit card stuff, it used to be at the very beginning it was the people who stole those debit cards that were using those debit cards, right? And then they were getting caught, right? So then they separated. They got middlemen. So I would steal the credit cards. I would sell it to the middleman, and the middleman would go and use them. And then it became a third tier. It was, I'll steal it, I'll sell it to the middleman. The middleman will sell it to the street person who actually uses it. So you get more and more separated. It makes it more and more difficult to prosecute. I'm more and more insulated. I'm more and more protected. It's the same way like the drug cartels work, right? 
you have the you know the head of the cartel. He's got his guys, guys, you know, all the way down. Yeah. Well, and Roger, you probably heard this. Um, after uh, solar winds and now exchange, the insurance companies are going. Oh, we are at a huge exposure. Uh, do we really want to do cyber insurance? You know, or those rates are going to become astronomical. Yeah, there's a right. Yeah, I think the heydays of them making 60, 40 percent profits is over. <laughs> yeah, I, I heard a couple that are saying that, that you have to do these things. If you don't have NFA, we're not going to insure you. Yeah, have you heard? Yeah, have you heard the ones? Uh, and I've got some friends that have them uh, where they they're like, "We'll cover you for five million, but if it's social engineering's involved, with one of your employees got tricked, we only cover you for fifty thousand. And they sign those agreements. I'm like, you. Are paying for a fifty thousand dollar cybersecurity insurance policy because the vast majority of it's related to social engineering. For the initial, like, unless they got into one patch software or some password issue, but I'm like, so now they're trying these little tricks of these exclusions, you know, and that sort of stuff. But it's, you know, we got you know, all these people that they make a living. All they are is negotiators, right? And they only negotiate with one gang, and that gang really wants to negotiate with those people. But can you imagine waking up every day and that's your job is hostage negotiation? <laughs> Um, I mean, kind of wild that that becomes your like. I don't know what you're doing in life, where all of a sudden, turns out I'm really good at ransomware negotiations. Right, right. Well, and, we've had yeah. incidents before where uh, the the insurance company wouldn't pay for remediation. Remediation essentially was going to be rebuilding the environment, right? Mm. right? Right. The ransom cost ex- or the ransom exceeded the cost of that. Right. So yeah. that. So then. But the, the insurance company still no. said, well, that's not covered. You're building the environment isn't covered. You need to pay the ransom. Right? And so they were going to cover paying the ransom. And then all the negotiations were taking place. And then the FBI came calling and said, hold up. You can't pay. That's a terrorist organization. Hmm. Yeah. So, then, so then you go back to the insurance company like, okay, now what? Yeah. What I I did, pay for? Yeah, I, I did hear. CISA, you know, that's with our cyber information or infrastructure security agency, CISA. They said if you contact us, at least get us involved, it, there's a good chance you won't be charged that terrorist, you know, we'll, we'll at least rule out that part of it. So you can't be charged by that law. Mm-hmm. So that's a, you know, a lot of times I, I tell people be careful when you contact outside agencies like law enforcement because they, they have the authority to take over that investigation, take your assets and direct what you do. But CISA has this thing saying, if you contact us, the Department of Treasury said, if you contact CISA, that shows us goodwill, faith, effort, and you're far less likely to be charged with helping a terrorist organization. I was like, well, that's kind of good advice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a bad day for that company. I, I actually felt legitimate or bad for them. What was the, uh, what was the outcome at the end? I, I think they didn't really have any bills. I don't think they couldn't pay. They weren't allowed. Did the insurance company cover that cost? I don't know. See, I yeah, don't had, know. Uh, the, the, one of the largest school systems right here, I'm in Florida, the Broward school system, they got ransomware. And the ransomware hackers did their research and they came back and said, you need to pay us $25 million. And the school system's like, what? We have nothing. We don't have anything. They're like, no, don't tell us that. You've got $4 billion. We've looked at your financials. You have $4 billion, which I guess is you know what the Florida legislature said that the school system could have. But he's like, listen, we're a poor school system. We don't have enough money to teach and do what we're doing with COVID. We don't have 25 million bucks. The guy's like, no, you're, I thought that's just a problem where the guy is, doesn't understand that, that, you know, whatever revenue does to make the profits or something like that. But, uh, and so they're having to rebuild everything. Well, it's, it's always so frustrating too because everybody always wants two things when they call us. Well, before, after they get the I to be ashamed. Not happening. Was data X still? So you're not logging, so I don't know. And then you get the lawyers who want you to say, you know, there was no evidence of data exfiltration because they didn't have anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Roger, you're, uh, tell me about your last, just for the um, listeners, first. tell me about your last book. Well, so I'll mention two. One, the last one I actually worked on was uh, hacking multi-factor authentication. So, you know, there's a big movement to multi-factor authentication in the war. And let me say multi-factor authentication is a good thing. 
But I found over the last couple of years that a lot of people that are using MFA suddenly feel like they're a lot more invulnerable to being attacked and they're still being attacked. And so I thought anytime you give some, the, the big thing where I see is anytime someone is given an MFA solution, they're not also told, hey, you still need to care about what link you click on. Because 90% of MFA can be man middle. And if you get tricked into going to a lookalike website, they can just proxy everything between the two and steal your stuff. And um, so I, I wrote the book and I found that, you know, you can hack any MFA solution. I even, in the book, I actually picked, uh, in one of the chapters, I picked my favorite MFA solution of all time. Uh, it's a Bloomberg B unit. I don't know if you've ever seen these. Like, kind of look like a thick credit card or smart card, but they actually, the user actually fingerprint uh, uh, authenticates to the device. The applicant, they've got a login name and password to the application and the application actually flashes a light on the screen. And you hold the B unit up and it has a light receptor. So the user is authenticating to the app, authenticating to the device, and the app is authenticating to the device. Wow. So all three. Yeah. And then I, in that chapter, I just hacked the heck out. Right? Like, so I take the most secure thing I can think of. I'm like, eh, if I was a hacker, this is what I would do. And I go through like these 10 different, 15 different ways that I would do it. And I love the device. And you know, that's the thing is, you know, MFA is good. We should all get there, but it's it's not like if we all went to MFA to hackers and go, oh, we give up. You know, just as you said, Evan, the hackers go, okay, you took my money away from this method, <laughs> so I'm going to concentrate on this method now. And they would just they, right. they're going to get their money, or or, or the users approve the MFA notification of the attacker hacker uh, logging in, which we see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it happens in. Uh, so I've been doing a lot of that. And then before that was actually a book on quantum cryptography. It's called uh, uh, cryptography, cryptography Apocalypse. And the, the title the title is silly, but it, it's just talking about quantum computers are getting ready to finally be sufficiently strong enough that they can break modern day traditional asymmetric encryption, which protects like 90% of the world, right? It's PLS and HTTPS, it's Wi-Fi, it's cryptocurrency wallets, it's you know, anything using RSA, Diffie Hellman, it, it uh, has the protection of symmetric key encryption. So if you have AES 1.8 anywhere, it would be breakable, probably, and so on. So I actually just got through writing a, a huge white paper, like 40 pages long for the Cloud Security Alliance and how companies should begin preparing now. Because you can do that, just like, like a simple thing of making sure that your symmetric encryption is at least 192 bits or bigger will be less reworked when the quantum break comes out. So you need to like change your policies. You know, anytime we buy something, if it's AES 128, we need to tell the vendor, hey, that needs to be you know, 192 or 256. So there's simple things you can do now to save your time, your uh, your time and effort. And in, in the uh, NIST and the NSA are likely with the next couple of years to choose what's called the post-quantum cryptography ciphers. So the ones that are not susceptible to quantum computers, it's supposed to be either in 2022 to 2024. They're down to the finalist candidates. And it's been kind of interesting watching other, like your favorites all of a sudden. Ah, it turns out that one can be hacked a little bit. And if you get hacked just a little bit, they're like, nope. <laughs> like right. all the, the guy that worked 10 years to make that cipher is like, no, no, all I got to do is increase it by one bit. And it gets rid of that. Nope. As soon as they say you're susceptible at all, they're like, nope, there must be a weakness there. And they fit. They're all it out, but that's that's all coming, and we're all we're all of us here. Everybody listening to this, within a couple of years, you're going to be in this massive Y two K upgrade to get from quantum susceptible ciphers to quantum resistant ciphers. It is going to be a part of your life for years. Within a couple of years, okay. So, great advice for the listeners: start doing it now, getting prepared now. Do we think we have a couple of years so that that date, uh, you know, the whatever the hell I call that back in 2000, that date for you know, Y2K. Yeah, the Y2K for quantum, when is that, you think? So uh, I actually, I'm in a minority of people. I think we already have quantum computers capable of that. I think both the United States and the Chinese government have it, but I'm not a quantum physicist expert. Most of them feel it's in the next 10 years. There's a I would say it would not be surprising to the majority of the community if it happened in the next couple of years. But there is a good chance that, like, we, a lot of us went through from the SHA 1 to the SHA 2 migration five or six years ago or whatever. There's a good hope that what will happen is NIST will choose these, they call them the post, uh, 
post quantum ciphers, PQC ciphers, that they'll pick those in 20 to 22 to 20 to 24, and then everybody will spend a couple of years migrating, and then the break will come. But I would say that almost everybody thinks it's going to be 10 years or less. I think that this year is very telling, telling in that I think that I think something big is going to happen this year. I don't know if it'll be the quantum break, but you need basically about 4,000 stable, usable qubits, quantum bits, to be able to break RSA encryption in 2048. You need 4,099 qubits. Two years ago, we had a lot of computers had 70. And since then, there's been absolute radio silence on the number of qubits out of anybody's quantum computer. I'm talking about from Microsoft, HP, Intel, IBM, Google, Amazon. And I had a friend of mine that's working for a company no one's even heard of. I mean, actually, it's a big company, a Fortune 500, Fortune 100 probably, but they don't, most people don't know that they're in quantum. And he said, within a couple of years, we're going to have hundreds of thousands of qubits. I'm like, well, how do you go from 70 to hundreds of thousands in a couple of years without without getting to that 4,000 limit somewhere in between? So let me say I'm a minority, but I'm going to go on the risk. I think it's already occurred. We just don't know about it. And you have different governments using it to eavesdrop on people. But I'll be shocked if it's not in the next five years that we don't get. And when we when they finally announce it, it's not like everybody's stuff's going to be broken into. It's going to be nation states against nation states and stuff. But there is going to be this rush. And the, one of the hardest parts about it is you need to figure out what encryption in your environment needs to be replaced. You need to do a data protection inventory. And it's probably a year's worth of hard work just to go, where's my crypto? What 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 is it? What type of ciphers is it? Is RSA? Is it Diffie Hellman? Is it DCC? What are the key sizes? Is it AES? Is it one twenty eight, two fifty six, whatever? And and all, think about the what you know. If you've got a Windows computer, I've got the encryption on the firmware in the UEFI interface, and then I've got the encryption that's in Windows, and then I got the encryption that's in the database and all this stuff. So you can figure out what's the effective applied cryptography. And then you've got to make a plan for replacing it against the critical data. So I call it the data protection inventory. That, that it's going to take at least a year to get the answer of what do I need to replace. We so that's why you can't get start. people to create an asset inventory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a, the pain will happen. There's probably going to be this announcement of this big crypto break and then with this huge Y2K panic by everybody. Just like Y2K, people say, oh, Y2K, it didn't really happen. You know, it never was a big deal. That's because we all panicked in the last year. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah. Right. So I think the same thing is going to happen with this quantum thing is they're going to announce, oh, my God, oh, my God, everybody's got to do something wrong. And it's literally going to be our jobs. And then that's on top of ransomware, on top of regular nation state yeah. attacks, on, on, on top of everything else we're dealing with. So I think you're going to have a lot of, you know, a lot of firms that specialize in it. And you mentioned a really, really wise person earlier in the podcast. You mentioned a really wise person that I think we both respect a lot is, uh, you know, Bruce Schneider. And one of the things I always, it, it hit me right away when he said it the first time is complexity is the worst that I know. So we talk about this and that and that and else. All that's complexity, right? So how do we manage it? We're just heading for a bad time. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and again, let me say my central idea, and I wrote it like 20 years ago called How to Fix the Internet, was we can make the internet actually significantly more secure without really adding a lot of complexity. It really is literally, it, the complexity you have is like the DNS system. That's all it would take. Something kind of similar to what DNS is. So not yeah. super easy, but not the most complex thing you ever had in the world. Just a DNS is kind of, uh, you know, that looks at uh, authentication. And, um, you know, it can be done, but we're, we're just not going to do it until the pain happens. But I even think, you know, what's the pain? You know, oh, Bruce and I, are, I love Bruce. I, he's an acquaintance of mine, friend of mine. Uh, I consider him my mentor, even though he would not accept it. But um, he says things like, what I love is like we're saying, well, how come things are so bad and nobody's moving yet? How come? His thing would be, maybe we're thinking it's too bad. Like one day he's in a conference and he had this network IT person go, how come no one's caring about passwords? My end users are still giving out passwords and they don't care about passwords. They should care about... And he goes... 
And, and Bruce responded, you're overvaluing how important that password is to them because when they give out their password or they get fished, they're not being fired. If they actually got fired because they gave out a password, they would value that password protection more valuable. He said, they're not getting the password protection value wrong. You are. That's so, a great point. Accountability, right? This lack of accountability. But even like, you know, why is our, why is ransomware so bad and this or that? He might argue, I don't know if he would argue this, but that if you look at most companies hit by ransomware, a couple of months later, they're back in business. They had their stock price didn't get the, the average company whose stock price goes down is back up and above a year later. And, and maybe there are people like us that are overreacting. Because the pain so far, you get a couple CISOs fired, you get a couple of people, but then, you know, a year later, that company is doing fun. There's very few larger companies that have, smaller companies do go out of business, but the larger ones aren't. So I think what will happen is that then, uh, like Brad talked about, no one cares so they get hit. I think there's just going to be this big event that hits everybody that forces everybody to wake up because they can't ignore the financial react. Like if our financial system is at risk, the SWIFT system, the stock market, it's finally going to be so big and the and potential pain that they're going to have to wake up. Right now, the reason why it's so bad is that overall the pain isn't. You get your credit card stolen, use the bank's calling you to tell you this and telling you they're sending you a credit card and it's in the mail the next day and your worst out of pocket thing is you've got to put a new credit card on Amazon. Yep, that's true. That's true. Well, the biggest, I think, fear of cyber insurance is a single event that affects like large population of insurers, right? So that and they just, would they just go to Congress and ask for a bailout? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. How much how many more bailouts do they have? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm with you. I'm with you. That, that, so what's the uh, what's the next book you're writing right? You're writing right. So uh, I'm actually doing I'm actually doing a fiction one right now. Um that it actually has some cybersecurity stuff in it, but it's more it, it's fine. So Adam Way 12, uh, they're all, you know, computer geek books. This one is the first fiction one. And I, and I'm trying, I'm actually, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. It's really got some incredible, it, it's, it's got cybersecurity stuff in it, but it's minor because I realized most people don't enjoy reading cybersecurity novels, uh, that are focused on cybersecurity stuff, but I do have some unique things in it that I think cybersecurity people really appreciate. But I, I've been working on this in my head in 10 years and it's so difficult to write good fiction that I've actually hired people to help me write better fiction. I have a, you know, a person who's a PhD and, and, and coaches people to write. So I've, I've actually hired an official coach to help me write better. And I'm, I'm so excited. I've got a really great story in my head. I just want to hopefully get that. So that's what I'm, that's why I'm working on a certification book. Uh, there's a, there's a new exam, uh, coming out for, uh, fishing administration certification. And so I'm going to work on that as well. Um, and uh, I've, got, I've got a couple more books in my head, but uh, I think I'm out. I'm through doing just uh, this is how you secure your computer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Brad and I have a uh, co writing book now called, uh, uh, well, we don't have an official title, but it's basically the uh, VC Cell Handle. Oh, cool. So, how to do VC Cell? So. Oh, if, cool. if you're hiring somebody to do VC Cell so and they're not doing these things, maybe you're not doing it right. That kind of thing. Well, I'll tell you, your, your last book, I, I just love. What's the title? Of the, I'm looking on my I'm, I'm security. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, the reason when I met you and fell in love with you, I thought, uh, I'm a guy. I think 95% of the people I talk to, they really don't get computer security. But not only do you get computer security really, really well, but you have even less patience than me for people that don't get it. And I said that, and when I read your book, I was like, like, I don't know if this guy would have ever gotten this published if he went to Wiley, right? Because he's insulting too many people. <laughs> but he, yeah, Evan is that guy that has no filter, right? It's not built in there. He's like, he's like if I have to have a filter, I don't want to do it. And uh, that, that made me love you. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. And that's one of the reasons why I, I, we do the uh, this thing called the security shit show. <laughs> exactly. Of course. Yeah. It's Thursday nights. It's me, uh, Chris, and uh, Ryan. And we just, just let it out there, man. I mean, what's pissing us off? Why, why am I so angry at uh, people that are marketing tools that people don't need or that don't work or that don't do the things they're supposed to do, for instance? And we'll just go off. 
But that's not good enough because just going off your own thing, what we, what should we do about it? Right? Yeah. It doesn't help people if you just there and bench. Yeah. Like, we gotta have the solution. Much. So yeah, that's my whole data driven, you know, I consider my data driven computer defense my opus. And the reason why is it's how to fix it, but it begins by recognizing what the, the core problems are because you can be distracted by a hundred different things. And I think step number one is looking at how will we successfully attack the most. And I figured it out a long time ago, social engineering and unpack software. And you probably number three would be free shared passwords or, or and or weak passwords. But those three things account for almost all the risk in most organizations. If you think, how was I compromised? It's, it could be a misconfiguration. It could have been a buffer overflow. There, there are things, right? You do have the solar winds attacks and exchange attacks. They happen. But they are day-to-day, year-to-year, month-to-month, not the way that most people are being compromised. So I thought first step is, is at least for us to recognize that we are not focusing correctly. And if we're in the business of risk management, we should actually focus on the risk, the biggest risk first. Yes. That's what that whole book was on. So I'm, I try to provide I love that part of the solution. That's a great book. <laughs> That's an awesome book. Hey, Brad, do you want to say something? Man? We have to spend huh? it. It felt like a couple of times you were going to say something. I was like, what I want, I want to say something important. Well, you got to say I, I got to be in it. Okay. Good. The only thing I was going to say was my first three mentioned was Y2K. That was my first job, was walking around the college campus into a floppy device to patch and match computers. And writing my first rat and names because they didn't have a NASA on this time. My very first computer se- or information security job was uh, cleaning boot sector viruses off of Windows 3 machines. I got fired once, though, for uh, falling asleep while I was trying to get into a SCSI card. I couldn't get the damn dip switches correct, and uh, and it would take forever on the same thing to boot. So I, one time I actually fell asleep while the president of the company walked by. Hey, you know you weren't ready for me to make you laugh. I remember one of the most one of the most common. This is how you defeat computer security issues: is make sure you pop the floppy disk out of the drive before you reboot the computer. Like, remember that that was a big deal. You had to tell people, make sure you don't keep your floppy disk in there because that can get you infected. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. And then you talk, you talk to Evan about how uh, hackers malware could impact uh, larger systems and healthcare and real people's lives. I remember the first time I felt that was the I love you worm. The I love mm-hmm. you worm, when that went off on 95 or 6 or something, I remember it, it blew up our pager systems. It took down our paging system, our phone systems. And I remember our newspaper. Uh, got delivered late that day, and the and the new a lot of news organizations were offline, and that was kind of the first time I saw that hey, this malware stuff is crossing over into what we would think would be real life, and now real life has become that online life, right? And if the internet goes down, you know, you know, I don't know how you, how, how would you book travel? You know, how would how how am I going to check my bank balance if the ATMs go down? How does this all work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I do remember that one too. That, uh, well, there's a whole bunch of stories. We're going to have to have you on again. Maybe we'll have a story. We'll have a podcast where we just talk about our stories. Oh my God. But I think the listeners can learn a lot from that because it's three ingredients to making a really good security person, I think. One is intangibles. Either you got it or you don't, right? Either you're trustworthy. Dependable, hardworking, or you don't, or you're not. The second one is education, right? right. Books, classes, go to uh, degrees. But that third one, you only kind of learn one way, and that's experience. And either you're going to learn it from somebody else telling you, like when your dad would tell you, don't put your hand on top of the stove, it's going to hurt. Either you're going to listen to that, or you're going to put your hand on the stove, and you're going to learn some experience that hurts. Right. So I think when us that have been around a while, I'll just call it old timers, when we share our experience, we're trying to help you not do the same dumb stuff that we did. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember the days before we had Google, you know, as you all do, right? And trying to publish with things that are like, I have no idea. I don't know what this error message means. I, I'm just going to click the button. I'm like, oh shit, I shouldn't have clicked that button. <laughs> So, yeah, and then I think in the IT world, the additional challenge we all have, whether you have experience or not, is about every five to 10 years, you have to reinvent 
and, and figure out the technology. Like when the cloud comes up, is that cloud going to do something? Yeah, because you can you can hop on a bandwagon too early. Like when was it Apple that came out with the Newton or whatever? Oh my God, mobile computing is going to take over the world, and it went away. And then I think early cloud computing kind of came and went. But I've learned that when multiple large companies spend a billion or more, it's going to happen. So that's like the way I feel with quantum stuff. That yeah. it's been coming, coming, coming. Okay, now Microsoft's built eight multi-billion dollar data centers. Google has one. Mike, you know, <laughs> Intel has one. Guess what's coming? You know, like they may waste hundreds of millions, but they don't waste billions until it's going to be here. And but uh, tr- trying to reinvent my, you know, like okay, I'm worried about malware, and I'm really good at Apple malware. Then I was DOS malware, then Windows malware, then email malware, and scripting worms and that sort of stuff. And you kind of like, you know, Java. Then I got into Java applets and stuff like that. You really do that. So not only experience, but trying to, if you're going to make a long term career out of this, trying to figure out, okay, well, I got to kind of start paying more attention to. I'm starting to see that. And these days, IoT is certainly a big one. It's, you know, social media attacks. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting. That's the extra challenge, I think. In other fields, like you're a doctor or a lawyer, they're sending you these magazines like, this is what you need to know. Ours is, you're being told everything new is going to take over, but very little of it is. And you have to navigate what the next thing is to kind of be aware of and learn how to secure. Well, they, I mean, part of my, you know, that's a big part of why I got into it. Right? It's constantly changing. It's, you've got to stay on top of it. You're always having to learn. And, and you know, I've had jobs where it's just monotonous and miserable. So I, I love the challenge. I love love. Trying to figure that out. Yeah, it's funny how the zeal for that, I think, you know, how it's changed over the years. You know, there's, I'm still as passionate about the mission and what I'm doing as I used to be. I don't have the energy anymore. You know what I mean? As you get older, you're like, I need to rest. I can't, you know what I mean? It starts to kind of pile up all that, all that beating you took when you're You are still running a very successful company or companies. Thank you. Thank you. I have 882 <laughs> days before I sign my life. Well, well. Um, the other you know, it's funny. I saw my wife not to, so I'm 54, going to be 55. I was telling her, when I finally do retire, I don't know when it's going to be, but, you know, I think 10 years or less or something like that. But I said, I really think I'm going to be able to retire and kind of get off the grid a bit. And she's like, hey, well, not. Nah, you're going to go. I said, no, 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 no. It's been kind of a light. I said, but I, I think I'm going to be ready to read some books and do some, you know, fishing and diving. And I think, I said, I think we're going to surprise you that when I finally do make the cut, I'm going to make it, I'm going to be, you know, a little bit less online than my life is right now. Well, my wife says the same thing. She's like, there's no way you're going to stop working. I'm like, I think you don't get it. I think I'm actually real. Well, it's like with ID. If you're the IT guy who works, what you do all day, every day, you come home, you don't want to do it. Right? right? It's like, oh. And so I think that like, mentality is like, finally yeah. not done. Yeah. yeah. True. Yeah. All right. What's the number 880 days? 882. It's going to be hard on every time you post another date. I'll still have That's very cool, my friend. And now I will um, we'll lift a beer to you. Well, I'll have a place for you to come see me anytime you want, too. But I'm going to, we're looking next week, we're looking at a couple of places. Uh, maybe part of my art team. Oh, wow. Wow. Seen some pretty pictures. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, 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 I purposely am looking at places that are large enough that friends and coworkers like Brad and whoever, you know, come see me. And, I, and I, most of the time, I'll probably pay for it. You know. Way to go. Well, thanks again for having me. It's always a pleasure. And, and Evan and, and, and Brad, it's uh, nice to meet you. But uh, I, I love your focus on the mission of trying to help people. And, uh, you know, I think we're, a lot of us are trying to help people, but you say it out loud and saying it out loud over and over again makes it a little bit more real and focuses everybody a little bit. And I appreciate you doing that. You're a wonderful person. And we need to have more people like you. Thank you, man. I really enjoy it. That, and that, you almost don't get fear because it really means a lot when somebody, you know, that you respect as much as I respect you and, uh, you know, says something like that, it means something, you know, so I appreciate it. And let me say, I'm saying this from a guy that was on a board of directors for Brad's like, I want to help people. I don't care about the money. And uh, investors don't want to hear that all the time. That's how much Evan is committed to helping people. He's like, I want to help. He's like, no, you're not getting it. 
I want to help people no matter what. Yeah. That's a, that, that's a fantastic thing. That's a, that's, that was a beautiful thing for me, me to see in action. I think I could have said it in my head, but not out loud. <laughs> but yeah, that was the thing about the board too. Yeah. It was like, like, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Long story. That, that was great. You're like, I want to help people. Like, you're like, I don't really even care about making super big profit. I just want to help people and make things more secure. Like, you said it out loud and you had your own money all writing on it. I said, that is a guy that lives his values. That is a, it, again, not a lot of people do that. A lot of people are the opposite. <laughs> a lot of people are making up BS products and BS services and making up new acronyms to sell stuff to people that's not going to work. And you literally put a line in the sand and said, I want to do the opposite, even if I don't make as much money. So that's a, it's a beautiful thing, my friend. He has a, a long-standing edict in the company that if he finds out we've sold something to a customer that they didn't need, he will run over that person with his F-250. <laughs> do you think he's joking? But I'm not really sure. I'm not going to take him up on it. You want to find out? That's wonderful. You know, what's my new, what my new favorite buzzword this week was like, uh, it was EDR, endpoint detection response. They were like, ETS, XTS, EDR. I was like, is that like next generation firewall? You know, like they just do it. And then a guy was prone, a guy I like was saying, oh, it's I went, oh my God, you just like made some BS term up and now we're going to start selling that. Like you have, you only have EDR? Well, what you needed to do was get the XTS EDR. Yeah. <laughs> we'll put it in with your advanced and your next generation firewall. And we'll give you a quantum firewall. You know, like this, this is what I got into it. I got into it with somebody this week about that, about this very same thing, XDR and I. I'm like, what the hell is XDR? You know, I can't keep up with your acronyms. And he goes, uh, well, I feel like uh, the next generation are MDR. And I go, I go, so it's what MDR should have been from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but this is based on AI and machine learning, right? <laughs> Don't go there. This is going to go on all day. Oh no, that's man, that is awesome. What do they got word bingo or whatever? But you got people that are so serious about it. I'm like, uh, I, yeah, they're like, oh, it's going to do this and do that. I'm like, it doesn't. It's not. It's like, and you yeah. just put a word on it. I even I ran into a vendor that uh, made a. They literally were walking around shows with a with a what they called was a quantum computer in a backpack. It looked like something you'd see in Back to the Future in the back of the DeLorean. It had this round thing. And all my friends are like, you've seen this? They got a quantum computer. They got a quantum computer. I was like, what? And I knew that, you know, there was no such thing as that. So I, I called and talked to the vendor. And they're like, well, we're really running simulations. Oh, and they said, this computer can do what no other computer can do. I said, it's not a quantum computer. So you're saying that a regular computer can do what no regular computer can do. You know how stupid that sounds. Right. Like, it's a regular computer that you just put lights on. <laughs> <laughs> no, the insanity, man. <laughs> all right. Well, we need to close it up. Uh, you're one of those people, really, Roger, that I could talk to all day. I learn every time I'm challenged, you know, me, I think you challenge the people around you to think more. I have so much, like I said, so much respect. The, uh, the 12 bucks is just insane. I'm trying to get to get food for crying out loud. Um, and I do believe that everybody's got a book in them. So if anybody's listening to the things they think, oh, I'll author. Seriously, sit down and have a story to tell to get something to share that will contribute to humanity. Uh, real quick, quick shout outs. Anybody got any shout outs here? Brad, you got a shout out? Anybody? Huh? I don't know. <laughs> Not really. Uh-huh. All right. I'm going to get a shout out. Uh, oh, you yeah, got a shout out. Right? I've got a weird shout out. And it's CESA, you know, the, the U.S. cyber. Uh, infrastructure security agency. I don't like government agencies and I think they're generally pretty horrible and everything. But I've yeah. got to say that this one organization, for what it does, it seems to be kind of current and in the mix and putting out indicators of compromise and doing, to me, the better job that I've ever seen compared to other similar organizations that have tried to in the past. I think whoever they put it together, they're being more proactive, a little bit more aggressive and being out there. And so, I've got to say, I appreciate it. They're, you know, it's a government agency, still, whatever. But out of what it could be, I think it's doing a pretty good job. So my hat's off to them. I think they're doing a better job than most government agencies doing that. Now, if we could just make something mandatory <laughs> versus voluntary. 
Yeah. Accountability, man. That's uh, it that goes a long way. So I'll uh, give a shout out to. Uh, I, I'll give a shout out to uh, John Herman. I know he's out on the road this week, you know, giving, uh, giving his time and doing the things. Running a great company. He's got, with the work that he does and you do, Brad, and that whole entire first quarter team, you know, exceeding the first quarter, being for, for the first time I can remember ahead of my end. Uh, that's cool, man. It was nice the rest of the night. They didn't have to play catch up. Shout out to him, man. And you, Brad. Brad. You too. Too. You just get like this much. You just get like this much. No. Okay. I'll take whatever I can get. Don't get like that much. I'm not taking it. Right. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, thanks to our listeners. Um, send us things by email if you want. We sometimes respond, sometimes don't. I don't know. Uh, unsecurity at profilemail.com. If you're the social type, uh, with us on Twitter, I don't know. Evan Fancy and Brad, 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 and I. Roger, tell the listeners how to get you on social. Um, Roger A. Grimes. Yeah, you know, you know, LinkedIn and Twitter, Roger A. Grimes will typically get you there. Roger A. Grimes is also the, uh, an older prime minister of the Labor Party in Newfoundland, Canada. I'm not that guy. So if it says fishing, if he's trying to mess with fishing rights, I'm not that guy. Not that guy. And seriously, people uh, listening, um, go get a couple of Roger's books. The one that he talked about, the Good in Defense, is one of my favorites. Go and get a copy of it. You'll learn some cool stuff. You know what? I just thought of one of them. Shout out. Uh, was it Dupuy? Dupuy, man, yeah. He's, uh, he, he had his, you know, he's got contact information to mentor and take part of, uh, with the students that are taking the mentor program. They just volunteer. He lets us use his site for practice tests in class. So, shout out to him. Yeah. I was surprised. Shout out to Clement. Yeah, he's been around a long time. He's running that CC Beer site, which has been that kind of iconic over the years for CIS entering or quizzing for sure. Right. Yeah, that's about it. We'll talk to you all next week. I'm just going to go here, everyone. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unsecurity Podcast. We value our listeners and would love to hear from you. Give us your feedback by emailing us at unsecurity at protonmail.com. That's U-N-S-E-C-U-R-I-T-Y at P-R-O-T-O-N-M-A-I-L dot com. Be sure to tune in next week to hear the latest insights from Brad and Evan.